um, thank you for those who've been able to join and it's my pleasure to welcome you again to the spring tea time. Yeah, it's a, a very fast one this semester and we're glad that you can join us. And uh, for those joining us for the first time, I know there's uh, 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 somebody joining us from Kenya, we welcome you. And just so you know, these events are held uh, every other week, bi-weekly. And uh, they're hosted by the African Studies Center with the, the support of the African Studies, uh, Kongamano, sorry, the student group called Kongamano, and then with the support of the African Studies Center. And the discussions are basically uh, all focused on the continent with different aspects, including the economy, the politics, culture, innovations, health, and, and, and current affairs, and so on. So, and before COVID, we, we have held these events in person, but since the pandemic, we, we, we've gone virtual. And, and sometimes I look at it as a blessing in these guys because we are able to engage a, a wider audience and invite presenters from all over the world. And the good thing is that uh, these uh, presentations are recorded. So that way, even if somebody missed or was not able to attend, they can review and, and they can um, engage with the presentation in some other way. So, so today's session will be highlighting the exemplary work that our esteemed alumni are doing in their different communities. And uh, this, the focus for, for the countries that you're going to focus on today are um, Kenya and Niger. I hope you, you had a chance to see the flyer. And um, our two presenters for the day are uh, Joylin Chekori, who is going to represent Kenya. And she's going to, she's a PhD student, John Hopkins University School of uh, Nursing, and she's the founder of Mongaza Cancer Center Initiative, that's a community-based organization in Kenya. And then uh, we have uh, Aminatu Sedu, who is uh, from Niger, currently a graduate student in international development at Science Expo in France. And she's also going to lead us through uh, an organization that uh, she recently founded together with her colleagues and it's based in, in Niger. So the order of presentations we're going to have uh, Joy go first, Joylene go first. She will give a talk and then we'll engage in a discussion for about 15, 20 minutes. And then we're going to move on and uh, listen to Amina. And after that, we're also going to have a discussion after her talk and uh, then we will conclude. So I want to welcome you again. And at this time I'll hand over to Joylin to begin. Thank you so much for accepting to be part of this discussion and welcome. Thank you. Thank you everyone for being here. As you've heard, I'm going to present on Mongaza Cancer Initiative. The organization is currently registered in Kericho County, Kenya. It was founded in 2017. And before I present some of what's on the slide, I would like to present a very, um, an anecdote, a story of one hardworking woman. It will help you understand why I co-founded Mongaza Cancer Initiative. This organization is aimed at educating women and girls on breast and cervical cancer. This story will help you see why my doctoral study at Johns Hopkins is focused on breast and cervical cancer and why I'm presenting this today. So this, as, like I said, this is a story of, a, of one woman. This woman grew up in a rural area where she was taught that women and girls cater to the needs of other family members. So she learned to prioritize other people's needs. When she's ill, she still worries about the needs of others and has no time to think about her health. It's, it's only when she's critically ill that she seeks urgent medical care. In a nutshell, her health is never a priority. So this woman starts her own family in another rural area with limited access to quality and affordable health care. The local health clinics, popularly known as dispensaries, are free but are often limited uh, in terms of medical supplies. So once again, due to inherent social norms that emphasize the role of women as caregivers, her children's health become a priority. 
Occasionally, she's compelled to wake up at night to rush a critically sick child to a private practitioner in her village. If the practitioner is absent or reports medical and medical supply stockouts, her motherly instincts tell her to tarry, to not to not to tarry till the next day. She wakes her neighbor who owns a motorbike. They brave the cold night and muddy roads to find healthcare services in a mission hospital, which is about an hour away. So between the hustle and bustle of life, she notices a painful lump in her breast, but she shuts her eyes to it and reassures herself that just like the colds and flu that she had in the past, it will magically disappear. So no need to worry about it. Unfortunately, it gradually mushrooms and becomes more painful. She gets to a dispensary and she's referred to a county hospital before she finally gets a diagnosis confirmed at a national hospital. She has stage four breast cancer, which is which in layman's terms means that she has low chances of survival. Whereas for, with, with like just hanging out with somebody in person like day to day is more the doctor calls her kins, kinsmen and tells them that it is too that it's that it's too late to to do anything to reverse the metastasis or the cancer, and then prescribes pain meds and pastoral services. This is the story of one woman among many women in rural Kenyan in rural Kenya among low income families. Many of these women do not have health insurance coverage. And even though this, the dispensaries are free, many women are illiterate. So they don't understand the need for preventive care services such as breast and cervical cancer screening or simple techniques such as breast self-exam skills, which can help detect cancer. Leave alone the risk factors, sites and symptoms of cancer. They're all a closed book to them. I hope you see why I do what I do. And I hope you see why my team and I are always thinking of strategic ways to help these women, including paying for their cancer screening. So that's the end of the anecdote. So breast and cervical cancer in Kenya, I'll give you a brief background. In 2020, there were about 3,000 cervical cancer deaths. And in that same year, there were about 3,100 breast cancer deaths. These mortality rates are expected to increase, considering that about more than uh, 120 percent increase in the overall number of cancer cases is predicted over the next two decades. 70 to 80 percent of cancer cases in Kenya are diagnosed in advanced stages annually because, um, and this is when there are limited treatment options and low chances of survival for women. Breast and cervical cancer are the leading causes of cancer-related deaths among women in Kenya. And this has been attributed to limited screening rates and also limited knowledge on cancer. So what does mangaza mean? Mangaza is the Swahili word for light. And that's how we came up with Mangaza Cancer Initiative. We wanted to enlighten women on uh, breast and cervical cancer. So what led to the establishment of Mangaza Cancer Initiative? It really arose uh, from my volunteer experience in 2017 through the Massacred Foundation Scholars Program, which emphasizes the need to give back to, com to our communities. So, and that is the need for uh, scholars who are part of the program to give back to the communities. So I volunteered in churches, uh, schools, and clinics to teach women on breast and cervical cancer. And this was just the, about, it was just about the basics of breast and cervical cancer. And I identified a gap in knowledge and awareness on breast and cervical cancer during that period, which led me to find a team to support my mission. So right now we have 60 board members. Some of them are, were able to join the meeting. So thank you for coming. And then we have 22 members and associates. And we also have two mentors who guide us as we structure and restructure the organization to suit our mission and vision. So locally, we have been able to partner with some organizations and individuals 
the first organization that we partnered partnered with in 2019 was the Kenya Cancer Association through an event called Relay for Life, which is a community of like-minded survivors, caregivers, volunteers, and also participants, including uh, some of Mwangaza members who believe that the future can be free from cancer. During that period, we were able to raise 50,000 Kenyan shillings from uh, friends through social media friends and acquaintances and this money was used to help patients that were undergoing chemotherapy in hospitals in Kenya through this organization Kenya Cancer Association. We've also partnered with gynecologists in uh, sessions that we termed Q&A sessions on breast and cervical cancer between 20, 2020 and 2022 that was the COVID period we also started a partnership with the Kericho County Referral Hospital since our organization is registered in Kericho County. And we want to focus on cancer screening and making sure that women from low income families get the screening that, that they need and when, whenever they need it. Uh, internationally, we've partnered with oncologists, gynecologists, cancer survivors, and also the Advanced Breast Cancer Global Alliance, which is based in Portugal. And this organization is majorly focused on um, promoting the wellness of patients living with advanced breast cancer worldwide. I know I've mentioned this, but just to reiterate, Mwangaza Cancer Initiative enlightens women and girls on breast and cervical cancer. And we focus on the risk factors, the signs and symptoms, uh, screening methods, and also available cancer screening resources. We try to connect women to whatever resources, resources are available within the communities. Um, so how do we reach our target population? We do so through social media, hospitals, local health centers, and high schools. Some of the impacts of our organization are elimination of equipment-related barriers to screening. This is a donation that was made by one of our e-board members, Hyacinth. We donated equipment that helped over 100 women get screened using the right equipment. The second impact is improved participants' awareness and knowledge on breast and cervical cancer. So far, we have reached over 4,000 women and girls through cancer education and awareness initiatives. And then we've also enhanced positive attitudes towards cancer screening. Most women usually fear the procedure. They don't but do not really understand how important the screening procedure uh, could be for them. We've also tried to demystify some of the misconceptions about breast and cervical cancer in Kenya and other parts of Africa. Some women still think that cancer is a curse. So we really want to make sure and to hammer the fact that cancer is a real disease that needs to be addressed as soon as it is uh, diagnosed. This is just a fun fact, but did you know that breast cancer also occurs in men, though it is uh, very rare? So the other impact is on uh, breast self-examination skills. This is one of the skills that we teach women. We want to make sure that women understand the changes that could, ha could happen in their bodies and are able to report to their providers as soon as possible. Some of the challenges that we've encountered along the way are limited funding for breast and cervical cancer screening among eligible participants. We've had participants reach out to us and want to get screened, but don't have uh, the finances and we are not in a position to help all those women yet. The other challenge is is on funding for treatment. We've had so many people reach out to us because they look at our social media and they, some of them don't, don't really know that we don't pay for cancer treatment, but we've had people reach out to us, but um, 
over and over, we've, we've just had to refer them to other organizations that could provide treatment uh, or could cover treatment costs, which most organizations really don't do in Kenya. The other challenge is that we have very few proactive volunteers. And uh, lastly, in-person activities currently are limited due to COVID. Some of the lessons that we've learned along the way are the need to actively seek collaboration with stakeholders. And then we've also identified the need to find strategic ways to engage volunteers. Thirdly, we need to invest in projects to generate um, some funds so we could do all the activities that we want to do as an organization. We've also learned the need to leverage social media platforms in our, in our campaigns on breast and cervical cancer. So what does the future look like for Mwangaza Cancer Initiative? Currently, we want to partner with the Kenya Network of Cancer Organizations, which is an umbrella body of all uh, community-based organizations and uh, non-governmental organizations that are really focused on so many types of cancer. We also want to partner with cancer survivors and uh, uninsured cancer patients and organizations in other parts of Africa. Then one of our long-term goal is to establish a cancer center between Kericho and Bomet counties that will focus on diagnosis and treatment of breast and cervical cancer. But eboard members have also mentioned the fact that prostate cancer is becoming so common in men that we may want to consider uh, this type of cancer if this uh, cancer center comes to friction and we are hoping it will. The third uh, goal is establishment of income generating projects, again, to fund our activities. And lastly, to register our organization as a nationally recognized NGO in Kenya. So where do we get funding for some of these activities that we've been able to do? We got funding from Michigan State University College of Nursing, and then also the Honors College. And through the Resolution Project, which partners with the MasterCard Foundation Scholars Program. So this month, uh, January 2022, we, being Cervical Cancer Awareness Month, we are sponsoring uninsured women who are at high risk for cervical cancer, mostly women who are living with HIV. And we started a GoFundMe page. So feel free to support our initiative. That is the end of my presentation. And I would like to conclude with this quote from uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that says, not everyone can be famous, but everybody can be great because greatness is determined by service. We only need a heart full of grace and a soul generated by love. Thank you so much. Oh my goodness. How touching and wonderful is that joy? Because um, Sometimes when I listen to the work, especially the work that students are, I have seen come to MSU, like I saw you when you, you joined MSU and where you are now, the passion you have to support local communities and, and what you're doing. I mean, I mean, you're doing a PhD program right now and that has not um, barred you from doing the much you can for, for, for women and generally the community back home. It's really inspiring. I'll, I'll tell you the truth. Sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm talking a little bit. Honestly, we do appreciate to begin with and also congratulate you for the determination. Um, I think I, I have uh, some overall questions that I, I would um, like to pose just kind of to keep us thinking and going so, so fast. I'll ask a very basic question. Do you think giving back or starting an initiative like yours is for everybody? So, you know, basically what I'm trying to say is that um, does it need for you to have that great passion like the one you have for you to do that? Or does that even help with the, 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 the focus and determination to do this kind of work? Other than that, if you didn't have a passion, basically, are you able to do work like this? 
So th that question is directed to me, right? Yes, it is. I'm just okay. trying to say in one word, um, when I ask, is it for everybody? What do you think needs to go into sacrificing to do the type of work that you're doing? Honestly, I think community service is for everyone. You just need to find something that you can relate with, something that you're passionate about. It doesn't have to be something big. It could be as, as small as you think it is, but the impact that could have is bigger than you think. So even if you're not passionate about, uh, let's say cancer, you can support cancer projects without being directly the person who is driving the whole project. So for instance, uh, some of my e-board members, some of them, their courses or uh, their focus has nothing to do with the healthcare field. I have engineers who are in the e-board team but they, they, they are very good at visualizing and looking at the big picture of an organization. So it's anybody can serve and you don't have to feel that huge spark in you in order to serve. Anyone can do it at any time. Thank you so much. Um, it's, it's encouraging. I will tell you, I uh, will leave it for members of the audience to, to ask or comment and then we can move ahead. Anyone who has a question or a comment for Joy? Yes, please. Hello. Go Hi, it's good to see you again. <laughs> um, so I have a couple questions um, and these are kind of narrow. I'm, first of all, I'm incredibly impressed with this work. And um, my understanding right now is it's, it's focusing mainly in this one region, one or one uh, specific county, maybe two in Kenya, is, or, is that right? Right. Yes, um, it's, so, it's right. It's in one county, Kericho County. Yeah. I mean, I can see where like a longer term vision, this is so important across the board, but everything builds in steps, right? Um, two questions would be, I mean, you've gotten some funding, but this seems like such a worthwhile project that, you know, and, it's hard to do because you're you're a PhD student. That is a full time job, um, and then some. Um, but is looking for any other like you know is grant money or other kinds of things. And, and maybe the first step is you have to be like a, a certified NGO to get that. And the second question is more. Um, and this maybe my I I really know nothing. I'm mean, learning a lot by just listening about healthcare there. But one of the things that's now more prevalent in the U.S. is vaccinations for cervical cancer, or at least for not sort of the cancer itself, but for the, I, 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 the name is eluding me, but the virus that often leads to cervical can cancer, right? And I realize those are things now like, you know, they do with very young children, which may have a lot of obstacles, but if there's any um, thought about going in that direction, so those two questions. If for in relation to the grants, I try to apply when I have time, but most grants are very competitive. I just hope that I'll find someone who can see the, the vision for this project, that it's not just a short-term initiative, that it is a long-term initiative that's going to serve uh, several people in the future. And with the help of the amazing e team, I hope that we'll be able to continue to apply for grants and hopefully be able to fund or to do more with, uh, in terms of breast and cervical cancer education and awareness, and also screening among women that are uninsured. And then in relation to HPV vaccines, I think Kenya needs to really make sure that parents are aware uh, about the importance of HPV vaccines because this is a very good program that could be implemented in schools because only young children between the age of nine and 12 are given the vaccines. In the US, in the US they give it 
I think among uh, ages nine to 12 as well. But then um, I, I think I think so. But in Kenya, it's 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 not it's not as well implemented as it is in the US. I think the difference comes when it comes to having a primary care provider and not having having one because in the US most kids have a primary care provider but in Kenya most kids don't see a primary care provider they only go to dispensaries when they are sick but I see a situation whereby having a very clear program on uh, vaccination of uh, uh, vaccination using the HPV, HPV vaccines will help uh, reduce cases of cervical cancer I hope I answered both your questions correctly. Well, that, that was good. I mean, and, and I see this, I mean, clearly this is, this is not a, a one month project. It's a life work for you, Joy. So I know that um, there's a lot there to do, but interest, interesting and I'm just learning so much listening and it all, it's really great. Thank you. And, and just to add on what Patty just said, I, I'm glad that you're in the same discipline your, your area of interest plus you, what you're doing with your project just go along. So it's a lifetime work, I think, for you, which is yeah. a good thing. Yep. Yeah. All right. Uh, any other questions or comments? For Joy? All right. Thank you so much, Joy. And if somebody has a question after, you're free to ask. Uh, after the second presentation. So thank you again. At this time, I want to welcome Amina, please. The time is yours. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Amina. I'm a master's student at Sciences Po in France. Uh, I was a MasterCard scholar. I'm still a MasterCard scholar here at Sciences Po. So um, it's great to see many faces that I know. Um, my, um, I, I created a youth-led association, uh, which is based in Niger. We do a bit of many things because uh, there's so many issues in Niger, like so many things we want to solve. Uh, sometimes it's just hard for us to focus on one thing. Um, and my field of study is international development. My presentation is pretty short, like <laughs> shorter than uh, Joy's. So this will go by really fast. Okay, so my um, association is called Aldeso. Um, it, it means progress or just go forward in one of the local languages. Uh, and then our slogan is change through action. Of course, it's in French, but I translated it. So it, it doesn't sound as fancy in English <laughs> as it does in French. Um, but yeah, so basically, this is youth led education based in Niger. Uh, our objective is to really contribute to the development of disadvantaged population in Niger through initiative techniques, in innovative techniques, projects, and activities, with, of course, um, a clear involvement of the youth. And we have four areas of intervention, education, health, environment, and also community development. So these are some of our projects and activities. One of the things that we do is raise awareness during, during COVID, um, we realized that the digital platform is really something that we can um, ex like explore and make the most out of. So we just decided to raise awareness on our social media platforms, like uh, on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and also LinkedIn now. And the topics ranges from um like cancer to um using hair products certain hair products to environment like not throwing um uh, plastics on the ground or on the street you know uh so really different topics we also do some social activism so we have a hashtag that we created uh it's called <laughs> uh legend is no which means um youth say no it basically it's a way to give voice to the youth and also create the space for them to um really talk about certain issues uh, for example we 
some of the activism that we did were on uh, women's rights, children's rights, um, unemployment, uh, and also the rights of the disabled population. So basically we create hashtags. Um, we don't protest on the street, but we protest online virtually. And it's a way to engage people who might not have the opportunity to be in the capital to protest, for example. Uh, one of our third, the, the third activity that we do is Moringa for All. I'm not really sure what the word for Moringa is in English. It's basically like a plant and we eat it. Um, like we cook and eat it. I'm not sure what the word is. Uh, I tried to look it up, but I couldn't find anything. But basically, we every month we go to an orphanage and with the kids, we plant like maybe... Uh, eight, five, five, from 500 to like a thousand like little plants and those are things that they can eat after a couple of months of course when they're you know when they're a lot bigger um and basically our goal here is to try to reach the um uh what do how do you say autosuffisance basically when you, Sorry, my French is really getting into my mind right now. But yeah, so we, we're really trying to, um, yeah, get to food security. Yes, food security is one, is the key area here. That's why we're trying to do it in different orphanages. Uh, the fourth thing that we do is fundraising. Basically fundraising online that we do to support orphanages, um, different communities. We the the latest fundraising that we did, our goal was to uh, get two thousand five hundred, and we we're able to get twenty eight hundred, which was more than we targeted. And I'll give more details about it later. And the last project that we have is called Second Chance, and this project was funded by the Mastercard Foundation. Uh, I got the same grant, the same year as Joy, which is great. So basically, to give a little background, um, in Niger, we have a lot of people who beg on the street. And among them, there are many people who have a physical disability, right? And parents, when they beg on the street, they tend to use their children to guide them on the street. Whether they are blind or physically disabled, they tend to use their children to guide them, right, to beg. Now, when the child is grown, when they, they reach the teen age, they stop doing it because they are shy. And these are mostly like girls, you know, young women. They are shy. They don't want to do it anymore. And then the parents now use the younger sibling to guide them on the street. So now you have like a, a cycle where in a family, nobody goes to school because the parents have been using the kids to, you know, guide them to beg on the street, right? So this project really focuses on the women who are uh, 16 above, who were in that situation, and now they're not doing anything. Some of them do some prostitution. Some of them tend to get married early so that a man can at least take care of them and they'll reduce the burden on the parents. Uh, some of them are just home because they have no education and no training. Uh, so it's very hard for them to get a job. But basically our project focuses on those women and we wanted to, I mean, they wanted to engage in income generating activities because our goal is to not impose change on anyone. We want to facilitate the change, right? We want to do what they want. Um, so we conducted a bit of re like research and talked to them and they wanted to do some income generating activities and they do different activities. Like uh, they know how to do makeup, how to make some decorations, like mainly in-house decorations, how to make shampoos, different things that will interest like other women as well. And yeah, these are just like a couple of numbers. Uh, we were able to do six fundraising uh, over the last year and also for social activism. Uh, we went to four orphanages so far to do the planting. And we also have some like orientation for high school students because we also, we realized that when we graduate from high school, nobody guides you as to how to make a career choice, you know, what field to take. Most of the time, 
we tend to do what our parents want us to do, like become lawyers or doctors, you know? So a lot of kids are lost as to what they can do and what uh, job goes with their personality and so on. So we really help them explore that aspect. Uh, of course, we have partnerships with people who do it so like we do it directly, but we have partnership with different um, organizations that help us in going to different high schools and talk to them, engage in those conversations. And then we also participate in game or like charity concert. And um, we also have like a sanitation day in one of the neighborhoods. So this is like the the project, the one of the, our last fundraising. Of course, the numbers are in France, Sefa. So, but as I said, like uh, a million five hundred Sefa corresponds to like two thousand five hundred US dollars, approximately. But basically, uh, we donated the money to the National Union of the Blinds in Niger. They have sixty-two children, primary school kids who are leaving uh, in the school, but they also uh help kids that are going to different high schools or university but also keeping in mind that teaching one blind kid correspond to teaching 10 um normal you know like a, a kid who's not uh disabled because it requires a lot of attention to teach a blind kid uh compared to uh, other ch children and these are just like <laughs> my e-board members um and yeah we also have a lot of volunteers that that are here to help us we have 100 volunteers not all of them are 100 percent active but at least we have a community of people who are ready to help us whenever needed and some of them are not there in person so they help us with the online activism that we do the online fundraising that we do and also the awareness that we do and just in sharing information with other people in their surrounding and those who are in Miami the capital they also um help in participating in like organizing on the ground activities so yeah, that was all, basically. If you have any question of clarification, please feel free to ask. Oh, wow. Thank you so much, Amina. And as I said before, this all takes a uh, first sacrifice and then determination and courage to even start because you don't want, most of us don't want to start and fail. So when you think about maybe, maybe not, that debate in you sometimes can discourage you, but Honestly speaking, we, we're very proud of um, the steps you're taking, bold steps, that is. And thank you for sharing about the wonderful work that you're doing. So um, one question that I, I wanted to ask is that um, you, you, you deal with so many issues, like uh, very many issues you're, you're, you're touching in so many areas. You know? yeah. so, so I wanted to ask, do you do this as a group or are you... Um, you know, divided into different uh, um, groups, as in who is interested in what. In so, so do do you work together, or you have some type of um, how can I say um, groupings within the larger group that works on the different issues? Yeah, um, I have a group, and we do different things. Of course, mm -hmm. I myself cannot do everything at once, uh, but my role as the president is to really support and guide and make it easy for people who want to implement those projects. And some of the activities are also online so that I can participate and I can lead those like either fundraising or awareness sessions. So right now, before the beginning of 2022, we listed, we have a list of projects and activities that we would like to prioritize for the year. And then each volunteer would pick the activity that they would like to participate in. So our role as the e-board is to at least be in two or three of those groups and to guide them in implementing the activity. We are like the incubator of social, of like mm -hmm. social entrepreneurship <laughs> in a way, mm -hmm. uh, because we realize that we cannot do everything on our own. So right now, our goal is to really support 
uh, people, our, I mean, our volunteers mainly, who have projects that are doable and within our reach and with our resources, of course. Um, and that's how it, we start, you know, and then we'll see how it goes. No, I, I think really that's, that's a very unique approach. It's kind of your facilitators, but you have people that uh, are working on the different projects and, 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 and um, initiatives that they think they're passionate about or they think are needed in, in, in the community. So yeah. I, that, that's amazing. It's, it's really definitely amazing. And um, congratulations. Uh, thank you. Sure. Anyone else with a question? Have a, so I know you have three key areas on um, you're looking at education, environment and health. How do you prioritize? Does it uh, just depend on what, like what, for instance, during COVID, I'm sure you have some, some activities on health. So I, I find it hard because all of these things are important but I'm wondering how you prioritize, when are we going to do health staff, environment staff and education staff? Do yeah. you, or do, do you make sure that you have everything or how, I just wanna know how your calendar looks like. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we just want, we just know that these are our three areas. We may not have a project on the ground on health but we know that health is an area we want to work on like do some projects on so it's just something for us to keep in mind so that when we see an opportunity in health we'll be able to like do it uh so for example on the ground right now we're just um focusing on like donating blood and stuff because we have a huge shortage so this is something that we can do uh within our reach and we have people who can help with that but it, it doesn't it's not because we have a project in health that we need to have a project in education like they are not equal like you need to have five projects in each area as you know we're just keeping those areas in mind as we move forward um knowing that those are the areas that we really want to intervene in so that we don't feel limited as well because i my, my my issue at the beginning when creating this association is that okay um I myself, I, I, I didn't study anything in particular as in like for you, for example, you know, you have a specific area of study, but it's different from me. I'm doing international development, which is very broad, you know, I, again. So I didn't want to feel limited at the beginning. That's why I was like, okay, you know what? I want to focus on those three areas. And if there are projects, I want to, I will do that, right? Like if there are opportunities, I will just catch them. So, and then like, as I said, I am right now, especially being abroad, my role is to really facilitate what other people want to do um, and to make it happen. So I cannot, I know I cannot do everything, but then there are other people who are as passionate as I am, who just need some guidance and resources in order to do what they would like to do. Thank you. Great work you're doing. Thank you. Likewise, great work. Um, very much appreciate the presentation. And, and my question goes back to understanding your volunteers who use the, use the word youth. And so, I mean, you're in my eyes, you're very much youth, right? But it spans a lot, a, a wide range of ages. And I wondered, um, so are you working, are these like high school age students? Are they people in their 20s? Is it like, you know, certain programs that would be focused on are your, like your, volu I, don't, I, I don't know if it's so much the volunteers, I guess it's more the volunteers I'm looking at, you know, who yeah. the, 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 the group with with you're engaging, what, what age group is that? Yeah, uh, right now it's between 17, 18 to 29, uh, basically. So it's, it's, it's a spectrum, it's it's a range, right? If a 30-year-old man wanna come and help us, like I, I cannot say no, right? If a 15-year-old is very passionate about something and feel like they can make change, so, I mean, so be it. But it, it's just a spectrum. But I just, I'm, I, I'm calling it a youth-led because the majority of us are between 20 to 25. Um, and also like the e-board members, like for example, we are still at school, we are still students, right? And this is, 
we are also we're not being paid it's just a passion and we're using our time to do it and most of us are just like you know between 20 and 25 that's why we're calling it a youth-led association as well well and that is, is thank you for that that's helpful to understand but it also is a question like at some point you folks in your early 20s you move on and you're in professions and families and other things so I'm curious if there's like an intention to build sort of the, the you know, succession planning, but sort of to, to continue to get young people involved in this movement and how that would play out. Yeah, uh, my goal is to really um, keep it as a youth led because I mean, we, Niger, we have the highest birth rate in the world and we have one of the youngest population. So it's really important to like um, include the youth and motivate them uh, and give them the resources. So even if I become 30 or 40, my goal is again to stay like a facilitator, make it easy for the younger people to, you know, access resources and implement projects that they want to implement and guide them. Because right now, I, I feel like I need it too. You know, I need some guidance on how to do certain things. Uh, it doesn't mean that I want my parents to come do it for me. Uh, but uh, my, my goal is to really keep it as a youth-led association. That's excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other questions? I see Dr. Malete just joined in. Welcome. Okay, maybe you can't hear us at the moment. Thank you, Damri. So, yes, I was on, a, on another talk, so just wanted to hopefully to catch uh, the speakers. Thank you. You're welcome, but then we were kind of uh, done. It went fast today. Oh, oh. Share something. Okay. okay. Yeah. Oh. Did you have something, Amina? Yeah. I mean, I, I I realized that I haven't really talked about like challenges and lessons learned. Um, and I think one lesson I learned is really, even though we have limited resources, we can maximize the resources we have. For example. I've literally built a website for my association. I am not a tech person. <laughs> I don't like math, I don't like numbers. Uh, <laughs> but I realized that I, I don't have the money to pay someone to create a website for me, right? And nobody can really uh, like do what I have in mind because there are certain things you just can't explain. So I had to learn how to make a website and create it because I know at least um, I have internet, I have good internet, right? And I just had like a almost two months winter break. So I had the time also to do it. So this is just to say that for whoever will watch this video, yes, we have limited resources. We might have limited funding for sure. But then there are so many things that we can and do it. And it's actually not as bad as we think, right? I'm not saying I'm an expert in web developing, but uh, it's just something that we need to think about, right? How to shift our ways of thinking, how to maximize the resources that we have and how, or how to creatively use the small resources um, that we have. So I just wanted to point that out before we finish. The, the, that's wonderful. I also remembered about uh, the some uh idea that both of you talked about volunteers volunteering and uh it, it's a challenge i know volunteering it's not something that i can say is, is um incorporated in in our way of life we, we we volunteer in so many ways that's not to say that we don't but in an organized way we we help i think being a communal society africa being a communal society we, we do a lot for one another but then um, in terms of uh, engaging in like a volunteer activity in an organized platform, sometimes it doesn't come easy. And this can be because of so many reasons. Sometimes if you don't have a job that you, or a source of income, sometimes you focus on that more than, than giving your time because you're, you're giving your, you're trying to find a way of, of survival first before you can, you know, offer time or 
and other resources that you may have. So, so what I was just commenting about is that that's another area that I think uh, we need to talk more about because it's not just with the organizations. It's, it's, uh, I think volunteering is something that is helpful because it's, it's, type of, it's a type of networking. You might be giving your time, for example, let's say you, you are a young person, I really don't have a job or I don't have a source of income, but I see an, an activity that I, I can be a part of whether it's because I'm passionate about or whether it's because I want to meet people and learn more about what they're doing. In that, because I put myself out there, I might have another opportunity opening up for me. So I think volunteering sometimes, it's a good thing because then you have to give a hand in a process, but then in another way, I see it as a way of just engaging with others. And, and by doing so, you might be able to learn more and develop an interest and in something that you can do for yourself or for others. So. I, I think it's it's really important when you talk about volunteer work. As I said, it's not that we don't do it in, in different ways, but then in settings that um, put people together, sometimes it, it becomes a challenge. So I, I just wanted to make that comment. Yeah, I mean, it's not always easy, right? So because you have a lot of volunteers that they will all participate, but it's just it's just a matter of finding who's passionate about what and who is, has time and who's willing to do it at a specific time. So that's what I am focusing on, right? I don't need all vol 100 volunteers to participate all at once, but if I have a project, as long as I have 10 people who are willing to do it, good. If you're organizing an activity, if you have 30 people who show up, that's good, right? Maybe the next time there will be another 30 people who might not be the same. Because at the end of the day, we all have something to do. We are all mm -hmm. students. And this is an unpaid job. So people might have other priorities by mm -hmm. default. So it's also a matter of understanding the state of the volunteers um, and how far mm -hmm. they can go as well. Mm -hmm. Just point. to add to that, just, just a quick addition to that. We've had the same struggles and we talked about ways to engage volunteers. And one of the things that we've found helpful is incentivizing the volunteers. So when we're recruiting volunteers to our organization, we, on the recruitment um, document, we indicate that this is what you get as being a part of the organization that you, you get access, free access, for instance, to our previous funder, the resolution project that um, offers free uh, net social networking events in Nairobi. People want, some people want to see what they get out of, uh, out of an activity or out of the time that they offer. So if you have such um, incentives in your organization, it's always good to indicate. That, that's great. Those are the many different ways that we, we, we might be able to have people that are interested in being involved, but um, lack the motivation to can be a part of the, the programs and projects that are happening around them. Thank you, Joe. I just have one thing to say to both of the speakers. To Joyline, first of all, I want to commend you on your initiative. Um, one of the things I like about it is how you are thinking about sustainability of your organization, trying to come up with income generating initiatives that way you are not dependent on donor funding. And to um, Amina, to um, what I like about your initiative is how you engage with the community to understand their needs. Um, one of the things that happens with international aid work is sometimes um, the agenda is donor driven, but I see that you are respecting your community and um, that ensures ownership and the um, sustainability. So well done. Thank you. That's really wonderful. All right, any more comments before we close? I, I came really late and I missed this and I was so uh, looking forward to meeting the two speakers, um, uh, in particular because I admire this level of work, uh, this kind of work, uh, which is uh, indigenously grown, community-oriented, 
and also social entrepreneurship, if you want to call it, uh, is a kind of thing that I think the continent needs very, very badly. Uh, first of all, not depending on the government. Secondly, not depending on donor agencies, as IEB is saying. So all of those are really very important uh, pieces of work. So I, I wish I had more time to learn more about what you are doing, uh, to hear from you about what you are doing. Sorry, I missed that. And also to learn more about the challenges you are facing in this line of work. Um, and the mentioning of sustainability is a very important thing because uh, in many cases, you, you know, we are just like businesses, people start something, then you run out of funding, you run out, sometimes people don't continue to be motivated and also you lose interest. But the whole idea of sustaining community oriented program that are aimed at developing, especially the youth, uh, is very important. So when I read the, the, the description of the work that both of you are doing, I was really, really very interested and wanted to join you. But uh, Peter had this meeting on a job search that we are doing in our department that it's not even over. So I had to jump off because I wanted to catch you. Uh, just to share with you that uh, for Joy, I am currently involved in a project in Kenya funded by USAID uh, and uh, it's focusing on youth empowerment. You may have heard about it. And, and the idea is to maybe connect with people like you to learn about what you are doing, to also find out if you can be inspirational to the youth because what we are trying to do in that project is say, we're partnering with the, the government, the federal government, United States government with funding through USAID. And the idea is, can we you know, instill a way of thinking, a way of doing things, a level of ownership that when the funding runs out can continue in Kenya, which can also be an example that can be replicated across East Africa and across the entire continent. You know, and I know in Nigeria is not too far, it's in West Africa, but you know, I, I believe that you know, with this work, we, we can learn from, from you. So I'm saying a lot really to lament that I missed talking to you, but to say, I would like to connect and hear more about your experiences and how you can continue inspiring uh, youth across the continent. Because it's, you build wealth through doing this kind of work. And some people think, oh, you know, I need to set up a company and that's all I need to do to make money out of it but the, the kind of social capital you build is so humongous and the impact it has in the community. So I really admire both of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just, just to mention, um, Lips, the good thing is that this is being recorded and uh, I'll be sure to share the link directly to you. So at least when you have a chance, you can listen and, and um, you, you, you can also connect with uh, Joy and Amina in case you need the, you know, support, advice, because they know what it takes to, to, to be in a space like that, to have an organi organizations like the ones they have. So at least you, they can share ideas with you, I believe. So I, I am happy to connect you with them whenever you're, you're ready. And also I'll be sure to directly share the link with you because I know I mean, it's, it's always shared through the African Studies Center, but you never know. Sometimes being busy, you might not, but I'll be sure to share that once we have it done. We also need ideas and advice from like other people too. I think yes. this is going to be uh, a two-way uh, relationship for sure. That's wonderful. I definitely agree with you. I mean, yeah, sh sharing ideas on a, a common um, purpose is always a good thing because that's that's why we're here. That's why we call ourselves community. That That's what society is made up of because if you were to exist in, in silos, we we couldn't be here. We couldn't even have these types of programs because I, I can do it without you, but it, it doesn't work like that. So we're here because we need one another and that's the greatest thing. Yeah. I just oh, wanted right. to, oh, I feel like- Please go ahead. No, I just wanted to comment on two things um, that doctor said. Uh, one, I think for us, the youth, we think that, you know, First of all, we need to be present on the continent to do something great, right? But we don't realize that people back home are also looking at us like, you have a lot of resources and opportunities, right? Why don't you make the most out of it? So it's also something that I had to, like, I had to change my mind on, like, because for the longest time, I thought, okay, I will graduate, get a good job, have some savings, and then go home. And then I realized that, well, the issues are not waiting for me to get a job and have money, right? So 
I, what can I do right now with my capacity? Whether you're doing, whether you want to do community development or you work in communication and you want to build something useful for the population on in that area, or you do, I don't know, different, because we have different areas. So whatever your area is, I just advise the youth to just sit down and think, okay, what can I do? You know, what, how, where can I start, right? And and just do it, <laughs> whether it's a conversation, that's how it starts and it leads to more action, just do it. And also the second thing is, many people back home, people who are on the ground, they also want to get rich faster, easier, right? And I can understand because you grew up in poverty and you just want to get out of it. You know, you're just thinking like, I want to get more money and stuff, but also like, you know, it's not always like that. Um, and sometimes like you need that networking, you know, in order to get to the step you want to get at. And again, like people, they have money today, tomorrow they're broke. So <laughs> life is like up and down, right? But then getting, being involved in community work is really something that is a bit sustainable, I would say, because you know people, they trust you, right? You build the foundation. And even if you don't have tomo money tomorrow, they are here to support you, right? And they know why you're doing it, right? And you're not imposing anything on them. You're just there to um, help the community implement the projects that they want. So the community is driving the change. You're just there as a facilitator, basically. And that is a sustainable way of approaching things rather than waiting to like create a business and become John Guti before you like you know <laughs> implement any projects <laughs> yeah you're definitely right because uh, sustainability as I've had it being um spoken about over and over again it's the biggest thing in in projects like this or programs like this because you want to first figure out how you can, one, engage the whole community, like bring, make them your stakeholders because they are. And then uh, as you do that, you get more ideas from them on what is needed for, for, for that particular community because it's driven by the need, basically, if I can say. And when there's a need and, and, and passion and once they meet, then sustainability becomes easier then let's say you have this much money of funding and then you, you're dumping it in, let's say, a project. You're not sure whether it's in, an interest in the group that you're bringing it to. So I think that the approach that you've both given your, your, your initiatives is, is, is really wonderful, very wonderful, and, and, and many lessons to learn from them both of the projects. So... I think I don't have any more comments. I don't know if anybody else is being locked out before we call it a day. All right. If not, I want to say thank you so much again, Emena and Joy, for sparing your time to be part of this discussion today. We've learned a lot. And what I'm always happy about is that this information can be shared. Your friends that you, you, you wanted to join and, and didn't work out the time well, they can at the end of the day find uh, the link and time to review and, and, and see what the discussion was about. So thank you again. And I look forward to connecting with you more. We have our alumni group. I definitely know that we're going to continue the discussions there. But for right now, thank you so much for all those who joined us, for contributing, for sharing ideas with our presenters. And we look forward to seeing you in two weeks. That's February 3rd. The discussion is going to be on, on health again. So not again, I, think, I mean, we had different uh, discussions today, but this one is going to be focused on DRC and our presenters are going to talk about health um, related issues, prospects, challenges in the country of DRC. So we look forward to seeing you if you have time. That's on the third. Thank you so much again and bye-bye.